Guardian is at Adweek New York. Here we are in the middle of Times Square and I'm interviewing director Robert Rodriguez. You'll know some of his films, all of them perhaps, Desperado, uh, El Mariachi, um, coming up, Machete, Machete yeah, Kills. Another, another machete. Yeah. Um, and soon to be uh, a TV, TV network owner, or network owner is going to launch soon. We'll talk about that in a minute, but there is one question. Sort of some fact from fiction for me. I read somewhere that you did uh, a cholesterol lowering drug experiment to fund your first film. Is that right? Is that true? There's a lot of legends that surround the making of El Mariachi, and as I found over the years, that that's like the one movie that all the legends you've heard are actually true. <laughs> that one, I did sell my body to science and actually documented it in a book that I had written back then. I didn't think it was strange at the time because anybody in college at the University of Texas in Austin, when you needed money, you would go to this research facility called Pharmaco. And you make, you know, a good amount of money. I made $3,000 testing what became Lipitor, it, um, that oh, really? drug lower, yeah. uh, cholesterol lowering drug. Back then it was called X5321 or something like that. But um, yeah, they tested it out on and how's your, how was your cholesterol? Well, it wasn't even that it was high. They were just testing absorption and how long it would take for it to get out of the body. This test that the drug administration has to go through before it gets passed. And um, I made $3,000. And, and you know, the movie was 7000 so yeah, you were halfway there? Halfway there. And I wrote the script while I was in there. And I met the bad guy who starred in my movie in the hospital. So it was oh, like, really? yeah, one stop, one stop <laughs> shopping. Casting couch. Yeah. Casting couch and drug testing. Um, but what we're really here to talk about is El Rey. Yeah. Now tell me a little bit about that. Um, well, this opportunity came up when Comcast and Universal were, were joining uh, a couple years ago. There was a stipulation by the government that you know certain networks would have to be given to independent owner and operators, four of which would have to be minority owners. So I, I went in with this idea for a Hispanic action network uh, that was mainstream, kind of like my movies, English language. So I like you know watch one of my movies, The Desperado or. Machete or Dust Till Dawn or Sin City. You don't think of them as necessarily being Hispanic films, but they are for those who are Hispanic. They see iconic, you know, characters, actors who don't usually get to be in Hollywood movies in this very popular entertainment. I thought, what if there was a network that sort of catered to this audience, this new, you know, millennial audience, action, adventure, comedy, uh, cutting edge, very artist friendly, because I. I'm the CEO of the network, so if I go to an artist to come create a show for us, we cut through a lot of red tape, there's no executives, and so I'm able to attract a lot of great talent. The first show we're going to do is from Dust Till Dawn. Yeah, that's right. There's a, you're doing a series, aren't you? Yeah. Well, just to rewind that on the actual film, um, it was George Clooney's in Dust Till Dawn, isn't it? Yeah. Now, I can't remember the chronology. Was he very far out of his sort of ER days? I mean, was, was he a gamble at the time for you to choose him? Was he your first choice even? He was my first choice. I was looking for somebody really new. He was he did such a good job of playing a nice doctor on ER that he couldn't get movie work. Nobody was hiring him. Um, and so what I like to take an actor and have him do something 180 degrees from what they do you know, normally. And uh, that helped him a lot, being able to get his next. He got three movies before Dusk even came out, once people saw that he was being cast as someone differently. It's a very reactive industry, you know. You can be very innovative in Hollywood because they, everyone kind of waits for someone to be first. So you can be first just in a lot of areas. And that was one of them, was, was casting George, and he took off as a star writer. He was a star. It was just people needed permission to cast him as something else. Thus gave him that permission. Now, some of the programming, obviously there's a TV series, Dust Till Dawn, sort of inspired. Now, also I was reading um, uh, what's been termed the Latino James Bond series. Yeah. Is that right, or has that been misrepresented? Well, well I mean, if you want to call it something, you know, Born before out we have a title, is... it's uh, work from Roberto Bor Orsi, writes a lot for J.J. Abrams. He created Sleeping Hollow, which just came out on the big business on, the, on, on Fox, and he um, writes you know, Star Trek and Transformers. And, He's a, he's a fantastic writer. He came to me because uh, you know he's Latino, and he said, uh, "I've always had this idea for like a James, like a Latin James Bond." And uh, I can't say the title because that's why you know the press is just called Latin James Bond. Full has a title um, that we can sell out, and so we're doing that. You know, so something like that. If I talk to them, we come up, you know, work on the idea, and I, I give them a 13 episode commitment. You know, there's no pilots, there's no executive red tape, which is, let's go to it, let's make it, I believe in it, I'll direct the pilot episode, and um, we'll make it a, you know, big show in LA. And who have they been saying, or who have you been lining up for the for the role? What's funny is, when that story came out, it leaked out that we were doing this thing, they called it a Latin James Bond, the press just on their own, and some of the websites had, had posted photos of people they thought could be the next Bond, so they were kind of did the work for us, and I gave us all a cast, like, oh look, there's a lot of options out there, it would be, a, we'd, we'd take the time to cast it. We wouldn't shoot it till like next March. 
Now the launch is coming up, I think, is it October? There's a soft launch in December, right. and then oh, January December. Right. We, we, uh, we head in full, and then Dust Till Dawn will come here sometime probably in March. And have you been putting on the suit and, and tie and doing the rounds? How's it being received? I'm dressed you, up. This is me in my suit. But you, you know, media agencies, corporate world, the, the sort of, how, how has it been received? Really well. I mean, that's kind of where we started. We went to the advertising community that were really hungry to get to this audience. They don't know how to find this new audience. And it's been a struggle for people for, you know, I've heard it for 20 years. People always came to me and said, you make these movies that appeal to, to all kinds of, how do, you, how do you do that? How can we do that? How can we tap into that audience? And it's just something I've been doing, you know, for 20 years in the film world, but now I think the time has come. No one's doing it in television, so I think it's, a, it's wide open territory to make this work, uh, to attract an audience that people find hard to, to reach, have a place to go to find them, and that's what I'll bring them. Well, now you, you've referred to it several times as a new audience or a hard-to-reach audience. So, what, what is what is the issue out there? I mean, what audience is it? Who are they, and why are they why are they not being served? Who is your viewer? Viewer is anybody who likes irreverent, visceral action and adventure and comedy and uh, innovative and thinking outside of the box, which you know businesses and networks and studios even find that hard to do. It's hard for them to shift with the times because it's a behemoth. That's why I've always stayed independent. That's why I've made movies outside of the box. I'm making it by staying in Texas, actually. That's why I discovered the shooting digital 12 years before anybody. I created digital 3D before anybody was doing that. Green screen technology like, you know, Sin City, way before anybody else. Because you're, you just continually go into what makes sense with the times. And it takes a lot of time, the industry, a lot of, sometimes 10 years to catch up with the times. So to be nimble and to be fast, you gotta have something like this, something like El Rey. And this audience, you know, this fast-growing, English-speaking, second, third-generation Hispanic audience that they don't know how to get to them, um, is going to be uh, not only who we cater to at El Rey, but also just the mainstream audience at large. Anybody who likes, uh, you know, Walking Dead or, you know, Breaking Bad, that's the kind of regular type of programming we would have, something that's really innovative and cutting edge and different. And if the industry's going that way, you know, we're going to go this way. How's it going to impact your, your movie-making uh, uh Career. Are you going to have to sort of put that to one side a little bit because you're going to have to focus on a lot of the output for El Rey? Or how, well, how will yeah, that work? most of my concentration is on El Rey, as much, and uh, I can still make movies, but I wouldn't make a movie unless it's somehow tied into El Rey because all roads lead to El Rey, and a lot of that is just content. It's all you're coming up with content that should be able to go through social media, through television, through movies. The same idea is a strong enough idea, and that should be the test, the litmus test. Can it live in, in many different areas? So it shouldn't just be a movie. It should be strong enough in its characterization and its storyline that it could, should be something that people would want to watch again and again. That's why I've kind of created already three, four franchises. You know, with the Sin City, with the Mariachi series, the Squad series, the Spike Kids series, and the Machete series. So I've kind of been in a sequential storytelling for a while and uh, ongoing storytelling. So television, I think, is a good fit. And obviously, throughout your career, you've had. Um You've been known for, for bringing up, up actors and actresses, uh, Selma Hayek and, and people like that. You, you'll be doing a lot more output with TV, lots of episodes, so that will be quite a big thing for you, would it? For, for new, thing, more talent. new talent in front of and behind the camera, and especially behind the camera, because those are the voices. Until you have somebody there writing the script that calls for change, it won't happen. You can't just go to a network and say, show more diversity. People making the content have to be diverse. It only makes sense, otherwise it's not authentic, and it won't ring true anyway. So I think it has to start from the ground up, and that's why we're building this from the ground up. So it feels right. Well, thank you very much for your Absolutely. time. I wish you the best of luck. And thank you. Lovely to speak to you. Thank you very much.